Father, in the name of Jesus, I come before you once again this morning. With this opportunity, as I open my mouth to speak freely with your word in the mighty name of Jesus, give me utterances and make every word that proceeds from my mouth today not be carnally, but shall be from the Spirit in the mighty name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Brethren, I am here before you again this Sunday morning with the opportunity to talk on the topic cleansing by the blood, Christian living service. Uh, before I will go in, I will want us to see how important that blood is. Blood is so important to a living being that without the blood, the living being will stop living. And we were made to understand that if the brain, the brain cannot stay less than three minutes, or oh, sorry, more than three minutes without the blood, uh, uh, without the without oxygen, and what is responsible for the transportation of the oxygenated blood is the blood. Is the blood that we take the oxygen from the lungs down to the brain and it can function. And because blood is so precious. God, too, is angry and visits iniquities and the, the, demand the blood from any that have shed blood. And that was why he said in the New Testament that thou shalt not kill. But we have found situation that no matter how pressured and how painful it is for blood to be taken, that also God can orchestrate the shedding of blood. You see, that he orchestrate it or we become a party to it or we allow it. We saw the, the powerful nature of blood in the deliverance of 430 years in the land of Egypt by shedding of the blood. And God has always used blood as the last card, the trump card, to confuse the enemy. And we saw it, how he used it to confuse Pharaoh, that Pharaoh had no, no knowledge, had no answer to. And we also saw how God used the blood of Jesus Christ as the last card to confuse the enemy, to confuse the devil. And the shedding of that blood on the cups of Calvary, that is even why we are seated here in the first place. And from then, I don't believe that except if any Christian killed, killed or shed blood, it's not for the purpose of cleansing of sin, it's for enjoyment. When you kill your chicken during the Easter. I don't think it has been written anywhere in, in uh, the New Testament where blood was shed for the remission of sin because it, was, it paid the price. And if we actually begin to tarry at his feet and begin to invoke the blood of covenant into our life, we will never remain the way we are. Praise the Lord. So what I wanted to do, first of all, let us look at the significance of the blood. The blood is to the body as aging oil is to a vehicle. Without aging oil, the vehicle will not function and will knock and may mark the beginning of the end for that aging. Without the blood in the system of a living being, the beginning of the end of such a being has just been announced. Blood is the fluid that transports oxygen and nutrients to the cells and carry away carbon dioxide and other waste products. Technically, Blood is a transport fluid pumped by the heart to all part of the body, after which it's returned to repeat the process all over again. In essence, blood is the life to the body and living being, and this blood can speak. Little wonders that in Genesis 4.10, the blood of Abel cried to God from the earth, and the speaking of the blood from the ground to God also establishes that there is a direct relationship between the blood and the spiritual realm. Every blood that is wrongly shed, God requires it from the hand of the shedder. That is why in Genesis 9 5, he said, And surely your blood of your life will I require, and the hand of every beast will I require it, and the hand of man, and the hand of every man's brother will I require the life of man. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed, for the image of God made him man. The blood is impossible to be resisted for the purpose for which it is shed. Little wonder we see people use it, especially the Yahoo Yahoo we have shedding blood. The blood is so powerful that when it is shed for a purpose, it becomes very, very impossible 
for that not to actually be to come true. I want to unequivocally announce to you, brother man and sister man, that is the invert of the blood that was shed that have characteristically determined the fate and the direction of mankind. The blood, the two blood that have were shed, one in Egypt and the other one that was shed on the cross of Calvary has determined our fate, whether you like it or not, whether you take it or not. Because if blood was not shed for the emancipation, emancipation and the movement of the Israelites out of Egypt, Christ would it have come. Even if Christ has come, he would also be in bondage. But blood was shed that night, and the Israelites were redeemed, and another blood was shed on the cross of Calvary for the remission of the sins of man. And that is why we can stay here even when we see sin, because the Bible says that if, you, if any man said he has not sinned, there's no truth in him. But you see sin, I go back and play the blood, and you are forgiven. Praise the Lord. And that shedding of blood formed the bedrock on which we stand and the main reason where we are gathered here in the first place. Before the event of the shedding of blood, in the scenarios we are going to look at, man was in serious bondage from the devil, whether as the devil himself or whether as the devil through his agent. The antenna consequences of this bloodshed were liberation, deliverance, cleansing, and spiritual lifting. It could also be noticed and noted that no matter how precious is the blood before God, no matter how painful is the shedding of blood in the sight of God, there are conditions where God himself orchestrated the shedding, where God take part in the shedding, or where God was actually in agreement of the shedding. Because I don't believe that for the, for the ability, for that, that God was able to remove his eye from the shedding of the blood of Jesus Christ because it was in agreement. Why? Because there was an end that had need to be done, which was not in the, in the eye of those that were doing the shedding of the blood. Because as at the time they were leading him to Gogota, if God has opened up their eye, exactly what was going to happen to the world, I think they would have gone back. The rival would left him, but they never knew. Praise the Lord. So we are going to look at the two main bloodsheds that have actually have defined the existence of man. God brought David, uh, sorry, God brought Moses before Pharaoh. When the children of God were in bondage in Egypt, I said, Thus says the Lord, let my people go so that they may serve me. But Pharaoh depended so much on his astrologers and magicians that he felt that he always had a match in Moses and whatever he bring on board. He fed for every, like we saw in the ten plagues, for every, every act, for every antique that Moses put on ground, Pharaoh will raise the sorcerers and his magicians to, cut, to counter him. For every plague and every power of God shown before Pharaoh by Moses, he always found the sole version in the sorcerer and the magicians to prove to, to Moses and God that it was equal to the tax. This persisted until the shedding of the blood of the lamb that Pharaoh could find no answer to. As at the time that blood was shed, he was confused. In the matter of the first ten plague of, of God against the Egyptians because of Pharaoh, he, that is Pharaoh, was always quick to call on his magician and astrologers. But was dazed beyond stupor, was flabbergasted and overwhelmed, and was less speechless when God showed him the strop card by the shedding of the blood. He was caught downfounded, and he orally sent the Israelite away, even at twilight. He could not wait. He was so disturbed that he could not wait, that the excuse that he had been given for long ceased to be that day, that he was the one that now came to tell him, please come and take your wahala away and let me live. Even at that, even while they sent them away, because of his initial, initial disobedience, we discovered that himself and his host of family were palatable and social dinner for the sea creature at the rest. Praise the Lord. On that night, two blood were shed on the night before the exit of the Egyptians. One was the shedding of the blood of the lamb. Two was the shedding of the blood of the firstborns of the Egyptians. Blood was shed before the blood shed. And blood was shed so that blood will not be shed. The blood of the lamb was shed for the Israelites so that the blood of their firstborns 
will not be shed. And the blood of the lamb was shed so that the blood of the Jisha firstborn will be shed. The blood that was shed was the last card that God played on Pharaoh. And that is why that, that was the last card that God played on Pharaoh in the uh, template that we saw. So I will likely go to Exodus 12.7. The commandment that God gave them before the shedding of that blood. And he said, And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side poles and on the unpaired door poles of the houses where they shall eat it. 13. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. 23. He said, For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptian. And when he shed the blood upon the lintel, and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door, and will not suffer the destroyer to come into your houses to my tree. 31. And he called for Moses. He was so bothered by the time he lost his first son. Because if anybody have told Pharaoh that his first son will die that morning, I think he would have loved them to scorn. I don't believe as at the time the firstborn died that he called on the first. You know, the Bible would not necessarily have to record every move. I believe he would have called on the on this magician and the sorcerers once again, and they have no solution to it. In in 31, Exodus 12, 31, and he called for Moses and Aaron by night. They were coming to him in the afternoon and begging them, thus says the Lord, let my people go so that they may serve me. And he said no. He will hide in his heart and they will bring one magic. He will bring the sorcerer to throw down the magic. But God gave him that which he could not comprehend. And what did he do? He called them by night and said, Rise up, I get ye forth from among my people, both ye and the children of Israel. Go, serve the Lord as you have said. As far as he was concerned at that time, they were now looking like God before him. Because every Israelite to Pharaoh in that morning was looking like God before him. He has resisted the nine uh, uh, plagues. But the last one, which was the shedding of blood, he could not resist. It could be noted that sin, why was the blood actually shed? Even when they were children of God, we can see that it was sin. There was sin among the people of God, among the Israelites. That blood had to be shed. The shedding of that blood was to forgive their sin, which was also in them. It was not only the Egyptians, they were actually in sin, but blood had to be shed. To cover their own sin. And that was the symbol. That was why they have to you know, use the eyes up to put the blood on the disciples and the top litter of their door. It could be noted that sin was also a daily occurrence in the midst of the Israelites. And the shedding of the blood was, a necessary, was necessary to help cleanse them for that night. For God's throne was not to be visited on them. This therefore suggests that shedding of lamb blood and the classic effects was temporary and ephemeral, which means that that was just done for the purpose of the exodus of the people of Israelite from Egypt. It was not a last card for life, but it was a last card for our Pharaoh, to confuse the Pharaoh. It was the blood of release. The children of God were released, both spiritually and physically, to the very extent that they were a wonder to their enemies. Like we know, in the size of lending and borrowing that we know, the lender will do all available due diligence to make sure that the borrower have the capacity and ability to pay, or even collect collateral. Sometimes collateral that are bigger than the amount that is borrowed. But the lender will also go as far as to add, ask the borrower to bring a guarantor. But here, there was a lender-borrower relationship that undermined all this ability to pay. Because when you see Wanda, your brain will be reset. We have heard of a brain resetting slap. That was a brain resetting slap on Pharaoh and the Egyptian that night. On that negotiation table, where there was a borrower and uh, a lender, both the Israelites as well as the Egyptians do not know the enormity of the journey that the Israelites were going to embark upon. But the Egyptians certainly know that the Israelites were living there for that day. But when are they going to return? They cannot tell. When do they expect the loan to be repaid? 
your guest is as good as theirs. Yet they yielded to the demand and dictate of Israelites in those very affairs. And the Israelites spoiled the Egyptian by reason of the bloodshed. Somebody just approached you. And the way it is written, I'm not sure it was a negotiation that was before that. It was a negotiation that just started. Somebody came to tell you that we are going into the wilderness to serve the Lord. Give me the best of your cloth. And you did not ask him, bring collateral, like it is used, or bring a, a, a guarantor. But you went ahead. Why? Because God gave them the blood and the situation that confused all of them. Praise the Lord. I come to tell you today that blood is a formidable weapon in the hands of the believer. That with the blood, as we begin to put it forth, is a formidable weapon. That if you invoke and evolve the blood of the lamb, difficulties will melt away from your way. And as you begin to do that, God will help you in the mighty name of Jesus. And I pray that as we continue to observe the blood of covenant in this month, God is going to strike a new covenant with you in the mighty name of Jesus. And that the blood that was shed on the cross of Calvary will speak for you throughout this month and beyond in the mighty name of Jesus. It will speak for you all through your life in the mighty name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Then we look at the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ that begin the end of time. The Bible said that after Jesus has taught, no, that is my emphasis, sorry. I said after Jesus has taught the disciples, he has started with them, he has started with them, he has taught them, and he, he, he was about to go because he knew from the beginning that which he came for. And he asked them, who do men think I am? And they gave him the answer. After they gave him the answer, he asked them, who do you think I am? In Matthew 16, 16, as Samuel Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. In 17, he said, And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon by Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed in you, but my Father, which is in heaven. And I say unto thee, that thou art Peter, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gate of fair shall not prevail against it. Praise the Lord. I think on this altar, I do talk about the shepherd and the fold. But here we see a situation where the shepherd was struck. And when the shepherd is struck, what happened? The sheep will scatter. And the war will happen, the sheep actually scattered. And for everything that happened, for the scripture to be fulfilled, it has to be. Because Jesus Christ has said it before in Matthew 26, 31. He said, then said Jesus unto them, all ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. And that was exactly what happened after Jesus Christ was arrested. But one of the questions I normally ask, that at the day of arrest, we, we, we understand that he was arrested at the, the Garden of Gethsemane, where we have all the ten, because Manos, Judas, they were present. But the Bible makes us understand that Peter took up a sword and cut off the ear of the high, high priest and he replaced it back. But have you asked yourself, is the only two disciples that were measured as far as the trial of Jesus Christ was concerned? One was Peter. And why was Peter? Because the scripture has to be fulfilled. Because Jesus Christ has already told him that you are going to deny me three times before the cock crow. And then you ask yourself, Assuming that actually Peter denied it, what would have happened? A small girl just asked to tell you we were with him the other day. If he had said I was with him, what would have happened? Because the thing was that the case was that the person that they wanted for the, the culpable or the culprit was arrested, which was Jesus Christ. Was anybody actually interested in that? I don't think so. But because the scripture has to be broken, that denier will have to come. And the Bible makes us to understand that when it denied it the third time and the couple, what happened? They look at each other. Praise the Lord. I say, because death and evil have taken my captive, Jesus have to go into the very territory 
of the devil to disarm me. You see, he told us before that if you want to spoil the, uh, the, the man of the good house, you don't do it by Bluetooth. It cannot be done by Bluetooth. You have to go inside the house, beat the man. See, if I am robber, I have to steal from you. What do they do? They don't stay outside. They don't stay at the gate. I say, everybody, this is bring out whatever you have. They will have to force their way. That is why if they knock and you refuse to open, what do they do? If I when they are coming, they will come with all their tools. I understand that they come with generator. They come with uh, that tool that breaks open uh, burglary. So what do they do? Because they want to fuck in themselves. They will first of all, put fear in you. The moment they come, they will shoot. No matter how powerful that you think you are, the moment you hear gunshot, what happens? You will be paralyzed. Some people are so weak that the men, more measurement of we are armed robbers, it, it, will, it will urinate on his body. All that is to what? To come and put fear in you so that he'll be able to get, and that was exactly what Jesus Christ did. He went into hell. The Bible makes us to the side, say, descended into hell and ascended into heaven. And he said, I have the key of death with me. He have to go there. We have to fight and defeat the devil. Jesus Christ said in Mark 3.20, he said, no man can enter into a strong man and spoil his good, except he will first bind the strong man. Then he went in to bind the devil so that he can, he can destroy and uh, no get us a, a, a life. Jesus made a show of death. Colossians 2.14, they blotted out the adrity of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. 14. And having spread principalities and powers, he made the show of them openly and triumphing over them. Jesus' blood was the last blood that was shed for the appropriation of sin. Because the bull, this, the, 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 the blood of bull and sheep was frequent in activities. Because we saw in the Old Testament, when they sin, they will say, take the sin offering. They will lay their hand on top of the bull and pray on it, and they will kill. Another time, they will say, go and bring a bull. Another time, they will say, go and bring a bull. But God said, no. They have to be what? A permanent sacrifice that will stop these incessant uh, sacrifices. That was why Jesus Christ came. I would like to read Hebrew 10, 1 to 14, but I, will use, I want to use the amplified version of the Bible. That even while Jesus Christ was coming, he knew that that was exactly what he was coming for. He said, he said Lo, I come in the volume of the book that is written of me. Hebrew 10, 1. He said, For since the law has merely a rude outline, say for shadowing, of the good things to come, instead of fully oppressing those things, it can never be offering the same sacrifices continually, year after year, make perfect those who approach his altar. That means you cannot continue to offer sacrifices every year. Now, where you go, you play the blood of Jesus. Will you have put uh, three total doses in your pocket as well in the, in the, in the bus? And you mash somebody instead of say blood of Jesus, you offer one total dove. It's not possible. Two, he said, for if it were otherwise, would these sacrifices not have stopped be offered? What is right to tell us that one sacrifice of a bull cannot solve the problem of the world. Since the worshiper at once for all be cleansed, they will no longer have any guilt or consciousness of sin. Three, but as it is, these sacrifices annually bring a fresh remembrance of sin to be atoned of. For, because the blood of bulls are gold, is powerless to take away sins. Five, hence, when he, Christ, entered into the world, he said, sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but instead you have made ready a body for me to offer. Six, in both offering and sin offering, he have taken no delight. Seven, then I said, behold, here I am, coming to do your will, O God, to fulfill what is written of me in the volume of the books. Eight, when it said just before, you have neither desire nor have you taken delight in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings, all of which are offered according to the law. Nine, it then went on to say, Behold, here I am, coming to do your will. Thus, 
He does away with the annals, the first order as a means of expiating sin, so that he might inaugurate and establish the second order, which is his sac the sacrifices of his blood. Ten, and in accordance with this will of God, we have been made holy, consecrated and sanctified through the offering, made once for all of the body of Jesus Christ, the anointed one. Eleven. Furthermore, every human Every human priest stands at his altar of service, ministry daily, offering the same sacrifices over and over again, which never are able to strip from every side of us the sins that envelop us and take, take them away. Twelve, whereas this one, that is this Christ, after he has offered a single sacrifice for our sin, that shall avail for all time and sat at the right hand of God, he has offered a single sacrifice for our sin and for all time, 13, then to wait until his enemy should be made stool beneath his feet. 14, for by a single offering, he has forever completely cleansed and perfected those who are concentrated and made holy. Praise the Lord. The blood of the land came and put a final, final straw on the back of the ass. Praise the Lord. That the price has be paid is actually not enough liberty for all. Christ has come and paid the price fully. For if you tarry in your old ways, the blood will not profit you. If you don't believe that because the blood has been sacrificed once and it's for all the time, and you continue in your old way, the blood will not profit you. Therefore, you have to plug yourself in the very promise of the blood of the new covenant. Praise the Lord. How do you participate in the cleansing of the blood of new covenant? One is confession. Confession of sins. The Bible said that if man said he does not sin, he said there's no, no, no truth in you. First John 1.1, 1, 1, it said if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk with darkness, we lie and we do not know the truth. You can't say that you know Christ and you are walking in darkness. There is no single truth in you. One seven will say, but if we walk in the light and he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus is son cleanse us from all sins. One eight, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. One nine, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all our righteousness. One ten, if we say that we have no sin, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. You have to confess your sins. Whether it's before the Lord, it is not every time they do altar call. You go before God and confess your sins. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Secondly, live a holy life. Confess the living in Christ and benefiting from the cleansing power of Jesus Christ does not stop and confession only. Because if you continue to do your ways, it is likened by the Bible to that that went back to his own vomit. Praise the Lord. You have to continue to live what? Holy. Romans 12, 1 says, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. By the mercies of God, he's pleading with you. Present your body a living sacrifice. Holy acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. For the fact that you have confessed does not stop and that. You have to do what? Live a holy life. Number three, impartation. I think impartation has actually been said so much, I've been preached so much on this altar. Impartation and lay on of an a prophetic utterances. That is why that if you are not in church, you'll be missing. Because I know that in the course of every service, our senior brother will say, stretch forth your hand to the altar, and they will prophesy into your life. It might look small, but it is often said that a little drop of ocean of, of water make the mighty ocean. Rome was not built in a day. Praise the Lord. As you continue to take that impartation into your spirit, you might not actually feel what it is. If you sit down and you know where you are coming from and where you are, you'll be able to give testimony. And our senior brother asked us to go and get our old picture and picture ourselves in it. And I went and get my old picture. 
but I could not picture myself in it. That was when the headmaster was a schoolboy. I was asking myself, I saw my wife in the picture. I was asking, is this the woman that I actually married that time? Praise the Lord. So those are impartations that when they begin to hit your life, you don't really know where you are going. But when you have it, when you carry it to your mind, it takes you far. Praise the Lord. I, I got born again in 1990, but I think I've always said it. It was not true. It was by design. I would have been born again for a very long time. In the university, they, uh, they were inviting me to church. I never, I never went. In, uh, while we were in service, a guy that was so close to was always inviting me to church to the extent that I followed him one day. And while we were growing up, we went to Catholic uh, school. And we were going to dodge, to dodge hunger because we must wait for the, the church to come back from service. And because we cannot wait till 11, we follow them to church because when you are at the church, you won't feel the hunger. But when you are just lying down on your, on your bed, but it happened. I was beaten and battered by devil. But the only thing is that the day the word of God entered into my life, it began to show. It was something that I could not really, I can't really explain. It was only me that felt it. Come out if you want to be born again and let us pray for you. And that happened. By the time I get back to where I was living, I was forced out of that room that, room that, that, that day. The guy said, you are disturbing me. If that disturb was not said the previous day. And to make sure that he meant it, he put his hand in his pocket and brought out a thousand. I said, take, please leave me. I have to leave. That's never been the same for me since then. So as we begin to receive that impartation, God will help you in the mighty name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Number four, I say invigorate, activate, and renew your relationship with Jesus. Have a personal walk with him. All this that we do here, fine. But if you now live here and you feel that that is all you need to do, I think our senior brother have always emphasized it. Say, go home and pray this prayer. Have a personal walk with God. I'm telling you that that personal walk is not just when you stand up and you pray and pray and speak a tongue and by the time you finish, you forget the existence of Christ. No. Carry that consciousness. Wherever you have let people... He said it one day we are here, that if you, where you are walking, that you, people don't know you as a pastor, you have failed. You don't need to tell them I, I go to church. You don't need to tell them I'm a pastor. But by your living, they will know that this guy is a Christian. Praise the Lord. Number five. Pleading the blood of Jesus to every situation and circumstances that you see yourself. First John 2, I say, my little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. We have even said it, that we have besetting sins. There was another movie we were watching. Just, it was even a on video, African magic. It looked so innocuous. It was just normal drama that people will say, where are you going to? Where are you coming from? Before you know, the language, if, when I was discussing with Ma, I noticed that he understood. The language the guy was, he went and bought uh, uh, Subalaja. He went and bought monkey tail. You know monkey tail? <laughs> And the guy was saying, if I take it now, let me take two shots. By the time I take two shots, I was now using language to describe the activity. And I said, if you have had children sitting by your side, watch this, we think it's a normal drama. Before you know, it is taken to another level. Praise the Lord. So you might not know when you sing. You just see a similar video. And, you see, and it will start well before you know. Things are beginning to happen. You have seen. So what, this, what the Bible is telling us is first John 1, that yes, we sin, but we have what? We have the advocate with the Father, which is Jesus Christ, the righteous. And this is the propitiation for our sins and not ours alone, but also for the sin of all the world. If you know how minute your number is to the number of the world, then you should know that that which was done for the whole world, by the time you plug yourself in, is what? Insignificant. Praise the Lord. He said on the cross of Calvary, he said, it is finished. And that was what marked the end 
and the Bible said that he gave up the ghost, we signify that your suffering, your anguish, then situation and circumstances and poverty and lack in your life are finished in the mighty name of Jesus. The supreme price has been paid by the blood and all deaths are settled and you are free. And the Bible said in John 8, it says, if the son of a man shall make you free, you are what? You are free indeed. And in this way, the son of man has made you free. What you are, you are free indeed. All you do is to proclaim it and walk in that cautious name, in the mighty name of Jesus. Romans 10, 9 said that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thy heart that God has risen from the dead, what happened? Thou shalt be saved. Thou shalt what? Shall be saved. Ten, ten, say for with the heart a man believeth unto righteousness. It is not something that is not done externally. You do not believe for another person. Your belief has to come from what? From within you. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. And as we continue to believe with our heart, God will meet us at the point of our need in the mighty name of Jesus. And will make us to be righteous in Jesus' name. Let us take this prayer. My Father, my Father. Starting from this moment. Renew a right spirit within me and make me a totally changed person in the mighty name of Jesus. In Jesus' name we are prayed. Say, blood of Jesus, in every difficult part of my life, speak for me. In the name of speak for me. Speak for me. In Jesus' name. Say, I plead the blood of Jesus. In every day and everything I do, and in the journey of my week, and in the journey of my month, in the name of Jesus. <laughs>